They're very popular this spring. Serviceable and correct. That's the beauty of camels here. They're quite enviable. Camels, sir? Camels? <laughs> no. <laughs> These waxen gentlemen. Lots to envy about them. Tell me, do they always smile this way? Do they always face the world with such admirable disdain? They're made to smile. Would you like to try it on, sir? Lucky devils. Always young and always grinning. Yes, I'll try it on. I rather suspect the skirt may be too full. <laughs> I rather suspect it can be taken in. So can I. As a matter of fact, I don't even know whether I need a new coat or not. <laughs> Hasn't changed me much. If that's what I hope for. However, I'll take it just the same. Yes, sir. May I have the name and address? Robert Mitchell. 53 Sutton Place. Oh, wait. You'd better send it to my office. 157 Wall Street. And by the way, where are your camera supplies? Down on the third floor. Thank you. Another one. I wonder what's inside of them. Nothing, they're hollow. Hollow. What an advantage. Fourth floor, going down. Oh, thank you. Down, sir. Step back in the car. Is this what Madame had in mind? Oh, yes, that's it. Thanks. Oh, oh, I'll put it on myself. They're very popular this spring. Engaging with a certain dash. That's the beauty of antelope. Well, I seem to look fairly human in this. Oh, a trifle shop one. Oh, I'm so sorry. Do let me get you another. Antelope? Why, I bag myself a camel upstairs. Why, Robert, what camel and what on earth are you doing here? A camel is a coat in its present form of reincarnation. Oh. <laughs> I'm after some gadgets for my new camera. What? More gadgets? Mm -hmm. Why, the apartment must be full of them by this time. It's empty. Way too empty. Have you got a cigarette, darling? Oh, yes, of course. Thanks. <laughs> empty. Just like the apartment. You don't deserve to be told, but I almost called you this morning to take me to lunch. I said to myself, it's a shame. I haven't seen Robert for weeks and weeks. I know, don't bother. I'll guess the rest. You didn't call and, and I had lunch alone. Oh, well, never mind. I'll cook you a dinner instead. Tonight. Just you be at my studio by seven. Is there anything funny in that? Yes. Something very funny. To be invited to the chambers of my... I'll be on time. Not you, my dear. You'll be late. Darling, am I crazy? Or have you never had exactly like this one? How sweet of you to remember. I had one like it. I seem to have lost it. Left it somewhere. Well, that's not impossible. So now, like a fool, I'm buying a new one. How do you stand for my extravagance, Robert? Well, here we are. This one seems to be all right. Oh, yes. That's better. Is it to be a charge, madam? Uh, yes. Mrs. Robert Mitchell. 53 Sutton... Pl <laughs> Funny. That old address slips out automatically. If I keep this up, I may have to move back there in self-defense. 128 Washington Square South. Oh, and send this one home, too. Yes, ma'am. Come, dear. Are you mine for the afternoon? No, sweet. I'm nobody's for the afternoon. I'm a free, soaring spirit. I sort of hope we could soar together. Third floor, going down. That love spells quiet dignity, sir. In fact, it shrieks quiet dignity. You don't think maybe I'd better give up the idea and keep my hands in my pockets, do you? <laughs> Or would you prefer something in pigskin? Well, anything but this.
Perhaps this will suit you, sir. No. Uh, no, I'll take these. Just a boy I know. Oh, just a boy you know. Yes, a rather nice boy. He paints. That's not so nice, is it? His name's Jerry. Why do you ask? Oh, I just had an idea I've met him. No, I don't think you have. Oh, I'll catch a cab. You must be dying to get at those gadgets of yours. Taxi. You could make me forget the best camera in the world. Oh, Robert, I'm touching. <laughs> Good night, then. I'll have cocktails for you. Cocktails? Oh, oh, of course you don't. Never mind. I'll try and learn how to drink them by tonight. <laughs> Goodbye. Six, where's 56? You've always been very difficult to puzzle out, Robert. But nowadays, you're almost impossible to put up with. You're perfectly right, you know. You mean Perry. Oh, what do I care about Perry? When the trial comes, you'll probably pull some legal rabbit out of your hat, hypnotize the jury, and save Perry's neck. That's your customary trick. I'm, I'm used to that. Well, John, what's worrying you then? You. What's happening to you? You're not yourself. What is it? Nothing. I'm successful and happy. Yes, very happy. Oh. Home? Is it Dorothea? Is there anything wrong between you two? For weeks you haven't as much as... Wrong? No. Everything is just fine. By the way, I ran into her today. Ran into her? Yes. I might as well tell you, John, we haven't been living together. Oh. Quite some time now. Six weeks. Two months. She has a studio of her own down in Greenwich Village. Well, is, is that to be permanent? I don't know. It was to be an experiment, to see whether we'd miss each other enough to try again. One year. I should have been able to hold a woman like Dorothea longer than that. No? Well, perhaps not. We couldn't get adjusted. You can't go on this way, you know. I realized that this morning. Come in. Package for you, Mr. Mitchell. Oh, yes, put it right here on the desk. My new coat, very dressy, and genuine camel. They go without water and bury their heads in the sand when attacked. But they smell. Even through the box? Oh, I didn't mean it that way, sir. Let's see it. No, John. I want to dazzle Dorothea with it. I have a date with her tonight. Flowers and candy. Perhaps I can win her back. Robert, I wish I knew what to tell you. Well, you and I went to law school, John. They didn't teach us how to ask a woman whether it's too late. Building tens. Big casino. Thanks. Simply outrageous. Aren't you going to let me win a single point? Here's an ace. <laughs> no good. Hmm. Fine for me. Sweet. Oh, they're lovely. But whatever made you bring gladiolus? Anybody knows they're your favorite flowers. Oh, Robert. You haven't forgotten. John Quill's darling. Oh, I'm sorry. Remarkable how close I came. All right. From now on, they are my favorite.
delicious dinner, darling. My first cocktail in years, and a hot game of casino. And now you're playing. I'd almost forgotten such evenings existed. I came here to ask you something. I've had it on my mind for weeks. It's been such a nice party. Don't let's spoil it. Ask me later. Don't. You promised to put on your new overcoat. I'm dying to see you in it. As a matter of fact, I wanted to wear it coming here. But, oh well, I changed my mind. I didn't have a chance to drop it at home. I came straight from the office. Oh, it is nice. But I don't know. This old thing. I used to be quite sentimental about it. You were seeing me through honeymoon eyes, I'm afraid. I'd stand on the balcony of that funny old Mexican hotel. And I could pick you out in this coat miles away. My! You look very dashing. Look again. Do you like it? Mm -hmm. Does it change me any? Who would want you changed, Robert? I would. I'd like to be dashing even when I... Well, when I buy a pair of gloves. Why gloves? The gloves because... Isn't that what your friend was buying this morning? Oh, Robert, I was afraid of your question. But this thing must be cleared up between us. Yes. Yes. Excuse me. Hello? Yes. Yes. Oh, Jerry. Oh, I'd love to, Jerry, but... Oh, I couldn't. Couldn't, not tonight. Oh, but Jerry, please be reasonable. Well, wait, just a second. You've been dusting ever since I came. Pretty soon you'll be down to the raw wood. Well, that's what people get for calling it such an unearthly hour. You're trying awfully hard to evade, aren't you? Yes, I suppose I am. Last night I had every intention of telling Robert. But you didn't. For a while I couldn't. And then he went away when I was talking to you on the phone. But why? It was a perfectly innocent conversation. You don't know him. He imagines things, elaborates, adds bits here and there. But Dorothea, we haven't anything to conceal. You've got to come to a decision, darling. Oh, how easily you say that. Ah, oh, Jerry, I don't want to talk about this thing endlessly. I've got lots of things to do this morning. Please go on home. Uh, don't send me away now. Look, it's raining. Let's go out and have some fun. We'll hire a horse cab and drive around in the rain. Central Park's swell on a day like this. <laughs> well, nobody has the right to be as young as you are. Maybe that's why I can't let go of you. Robert never needed my help in anything. And somehow you do. Oh, are you? And the way you laugh. You know, it's very hard to remember poor Robert when you laugh. Feel it. Feel how warm it is. Come on. Let's go out to the park, huh? No, I can't today. And you ought to go home, too. A little work won't hurt you once in a while. But the light's so bad and the rain's so nice. I can't work on a day like this. And besides... Besides? Complications. A woman. My past. 
bury it, my dear, and go home and get to work. I'm afraid to go home. I'm not fooling. Afraid? Well, yes. Sort of. You see, there's a fool girl got back from China about a week ago. She's been on my trail ever since. China? I didn't know you had exotic tastes, darling. Well, she's pure Nordic, straight out of Greenwich Village. About a year ago after a party, I, I suddenly found her in my arms. We weren't ever in love or anything like that. Why should she... I wish you'd tell me what to do. Go and talk to her. It's best to face situations. Yeah? Well, when are you going to face yours? With Robert? Tomorrow. I'll have to. Please go now. You can't throw me out like this. It's raining cats and dogs. And I haven't even got an umbrella. Umbrella? Well, I've got a lavender silk. Oh, wait a minute. Here's an old coat Robert left last night. Come on, slip it on. Well, you know, there's, there's something faintly caddish about this. Nonsense. You'll bring it back. Why don't you come and get it? Let's say you'll be up in my place at 7.30. I might blow you to a show. And I might blow you to a kiss. Why not? <laughs> Thank you so much, Mrs. Cooper. And do call again, won't you? Hello, Gretchen. Hello, Jerry. Any luck today? Oh, dear. I don't seem to be able to do a thing for you, Jerry. You know, people just adore your picture, but they stubbornly refuse to buy it. Well, then I'll just have to get even with them. What are you doing? Adding a zero to the price? I'd rather not sell a picture for a thousand than a hundred. Helps my reputation. You want me to sell this masterpiece? Oh, I couldn't. Besides, who would buy it? There's the rub. However. Bye, Jerry. Goodbye, Greg. Well, there we are. Oh. There's two dollars. I can let you have it for a dollar and a half, so humiliating this haggling. No, thanks. I'm just browsing. Oh, then you won't mind being left alone a few moments. I have to take my dog for an airing. If you just keep an eye on the shop. Hello, Tommy. Evening, Sam. Ain't Mr. Hutchin back yet? No, not yet. Hello, Sam. Hi, Mr. Hutchin. How are you? I just brought you along. I've been looking for you all day. <laughs> well, I'll just take this on upstairs with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. of acting, Anne. You see, real candidates for suicide don't say, where am I anymore? Mm hmm. And they don't leave the window open either. The gas might escape. Oh, I could choke you. You have no romance in you. Well, now that you didn't die of gas, and I didn't die of fright, perhaps you'd better run along. Not amusing me, especially. Give me that coat. Can't you see I'm shivering? Well, where's your dress? I haven't got any. What? I burned it.
I see. No gentleman would send a lady home unprotected against the elements. Very clever. Don't worry. I have no idea of going home. You can't even throw me out. It's ever so comfy right here. Well, my dear, the great fire trick isn't going to work either. I'm still asking you to leave. Oh, Jerry, aren't you glad I'm not dead? You used to love me. Oh, that was a case of mistaken identity. I took you at your face value. It's a pretty face at that. But I'd rather remember it from a distance. But, Jerry, I have no other place to go. New York has marvelous hotels. And if you're strapped, I'll give you the money. I'm really, really insane about you. Sounds reminiscent. You told me exactly that before you ran off to China with Jack Carpenter. Jack was a monster. He left me stranded on a junk. If you send me away, I'll... Well, I can't let you stay here. You're a nuisance and you're treacherous. And I'm expecting a visitor. A woman. A woman. A lady I happen to be in love with. Yeah? Well, just watch me leave. You make me leave. Hello, darling. Huh? Oh, I beg your pardon, operator. No, I didn't mean you. I thought I had my number. I want Hudson 41515. Cut it out, you. Hello. Dorothea, dear. I'm telephoning to tell you not to come over. I... And for heaven's sake. What? What? No, I didn't hear anything. It must be a disturbance on the line. Darling, I'm in a hurry. Wait for me at your... Wait for me. I'll be right over. <coughs> Give me that. What got into you anyway? Love. Well, thanks, but you're too demonstrative. If you're still here when I get back, I'll dump you out on the street. You're looking at a genuine Hutchins. A thousand dollars? Is it a matter of dollars and cents? That's an abstract cow by a great artist. Was that Mr. Hutchins in here a little while ago? Yes. The only living painter who can filter so humble a beast through his consciousness and endow it with poignant, fourth-dimensional pathos. But you won't buy it, I know. You'll want a book. Something popular. Very popular. A telephone book. Would you mind terribly if I used it? Certainly not. Go right ahead. Thank you. Oh, Hutchins will produce even more gigantic things. If he only worked harder. But you know what artists are like. Anything is more important to them than work. A love affair, a woman, anything. Oh. Oh, this 
is here in our mudster? Well, good evening. I... I'm looking for Mr. Hutchins. Shake. <laughs> so am I. Come on in. Well, thanks. He's out. Out with his woman. His... And you? I'm... Oh, I'm his girl. You came just the right time. I was getting sort of blue. His girl? <laughs> That's life for you. I'm his girl, he's out with his woman. Okay, I'm not jealous. <laughs> Come on now. Sit right down there and tell Annie all about life. Did Mr. Hutchins happen to say when he was coming back? He didn't happen. I told you he's out with his woman. Oh, yes. Yes. Oh. You don't want to talk about it. Touchy. A woman's honor, eh? <laughs> so that's what you came for. To have it out with him. <laughs> well, what are you going to do? Shoot him? Why, um... Uh... No, I don't think so. You don't think so? Then maybe you were thinking about it. Now, don't you be afraid. There's not going to be any shooting. You see, I'm not in the habit of carrying a gun. No. But if you had the chance... I'm sorry, no. There's one in the house. You know, you're awfully kind, but I'm afraid I'd be very awkward with firearms. So... Please don't go to any trouble. Oh, it's no trouble at all. Now, look here. Oh, no, that'd be swell. That'd be exciting. You're a little too excited already. No. Drunk. Good and drunk. I know how you feel. I've been that way myself. Want to have a drink now? No, thanks. I've got to talk with Mr. Hutchins. Talk? <laughs> Is that all? <laughs> Where will that get you? Well, I'm supposed to be a very good talker. You're a funny duck. Tell me, you love her much? You mean this wife? This lady? Yes. Very much. Tell me about her. Is she beautiful? To me, she's beautiful. But then she's all I've got. Part of me. Wife, daughter, dream and reality. What's the matter? Oh, the way you talk about her. If any man ever spoke that way about me... Well, why shouldn't somebody speak of you this way? Somebody who loves you? Because they don't love me. <laughs> why should they? <laughs> what am I? Well, look at me. Can't you tell? Why should they do anything but kick me around? <laughs> I'm a fake. I'm a mess. Oh, why didn't I kill myself? I started to... Why didn't I do it? Now, look here. You... Oh, I know. You think I need another drink. Another drink, another man, then what? Nothing! You don't think I've got the nerve to go through with it, do you? Neither does Jerry. All right. I'll show you both. What was that number? Hudson. One, five, one, five. What are you calling that number for? Get away. What are you trying to do? Something I should have done a long time ago. And I want him to hear this. Hello? Stop it, I tell you. Hello? Uh, no. There's a man here! Mr. Mason.
Mr. Hutchins? Hutchins had nothing to do with it. That's what you're saying, isn't it? The police haven't found him. Is he at your studio? Yes. He can't stay there. I won't allow it. I mean, I must advise you not to let your name be dragged into this. And your name? Robert, what have I done to you? It says here they found in the apartment a woman's hat. An antelope hat. Yours? I told you I lost it, left it somewhere. This is the new one I bought. And I think you'd better leave this one somewhere too. Thank you. The police might jump at conclusions. The victim was found lying on a blood-stained overcoat. Police have that coat, of course. And what the papers so touchingly describe is the murder glove. And now, have you told me everything? Have you? You told me up to the point where your friend phoned you. Who else called you last night? Nobody. My phone didn't ring at all. Now think. You wouldn't be likely to forget such a call. What call? What do you mean? Unless you. Did you try to phone me, Robert? Your number is Hudson 1515, isn't it? Yes. Oh, Robert, you did. You did try to phone me. But I assure you, my phone didn't ring. Well, perhaps it's out of order. It should be reported if it is. Oh, but it isn't. Well, I'll try just for fun. Hudson 31515. Oh. But my number is Hudson 4. That's probably why you didn't get me. Hello? Oh, but please don't bother. Who? I beg your pardon. I didn't quite get the name. Oh, I'm sorry. It's a wrong number. Yes. Thank you. I told you that wasn't my number. Robert. If you'd excuse me a second, I'm looking up another lawyer for you. Somebody you can trust. You're that lawyer, Robert. No, I can't defend him. Not if he's innocent? Not if I... There are other lawyers. I'll send you to the best. You, Robert. You can't refuse. I'll pay you anything. You know this boy is innocent. If you have a conscience, you'll defend him. Conscience? What has my conscience to do with it? Answer me. Because this is your revenge. All right, Dorothy. I'm willing to compromise. Oh. But I have certain conditions. Anything. Any conditions. First, I must meet Jerry Hutchins. That's likely to be difficult. Oh, you'll understand, Jerry. You'll like him. You'll forgive me if I don't clasp him to my heart exactly. You had a second condition. Ah, oh, yes. A second condition. You hold the alibi for Jerry Hutchins. He spent the evening with you in your studio. Yes. You can prove that. Yes. You're ready to take the stand and answer questions about him. About the two of you. Questions? Yes. You'll be threatened and bullied. 
you'll be faced with cheap insinuations. The district attorney doesn't specialize in delicacy. Why was he there? What time did he leave? Midnight? Later? Much later? Or didn't he leave at all? Why didn't he return to his apartment? Why? Are these the questions you want to answer? No. I couldn't, not with you there, Robert. Then you'd better get yourself another lawyer. No. I don't trust anybody but you. All right. I'm ready to tell you my second condition. I've told you I'll accept anything. You will never take the stand. You will never present that alibi. You must have no connection with this case. But it's his only alibi. Yes. But it's the alibi he can never use. That is my second condition. The third? If I undertake this case, whether I free Jerry Hutchins or not, you must come back to me. Whether I free him or not, You're an expensive lawyer, Robert. intention of keeping you waiting. Is he here? Yes. Out in the terrace. Last table to the right. You realize it was your last meeting? I remember my promise. Well, goodbye then. Goodbye. For one more thing. Yes? Before I go in to see him, you haven't changed your mind. You still can, you know. Remember. <laughs> Remember, I didn't guarantee to free him. I trust you and I'll keep my word. Exactly a quarter of ten. I promised the district attorney I would deliver Jerry Hutchins at ten. He'll be outside at the end table to the right. I'll see you gentlemen later. How would you like to play a game? I give you a poem and you guess the author, see? All right, shoot. Only classics, though. I ain't up on the modern stuff. Hail to thee, blithe spirit, boy, thou never work. Shelley, to a skylark. <laughs> good evening. Oh, good evening. I suppose there is no need for introductions. We have friends in common, haven't we? Yes, sir. This is a great kindness. I do appreciate it. May I? Please. Thank you. I won't keep you long. Fifteen minutes or so. Well, whatever you say, of course. But before we begin, Mrs. Mitchell has told me of your two conditions. Two? Well, I understand that her name is to be kept out of this affair at all costs. I'm glad of that. I feel just as you do about it. That's final, then. Mr. Hutchins, you are accused of the murder of Ann Brewster. You are accused of having killed her in a sudden fit of rage. 
What proof have you of your innocence? It's proof that we need. Proof? No. But I didn't kill... She committed suicide, I know. No? You mean you think? But she tried suicide several times before. She... <clears throat> See, we quarreled. She, she was a neurotic. She imagined for the moment that she was in love with me. I'm not interested in the details of your conquests. Time is passing and you have no proof. Only an alibi that you spent the evening with. Mr. Hutchins, I want to be fair with you. I can easily step out of this case and release Mrs. Mitchell from her promise. And you can use that alibi. No. Don't you understand? I love her. She means more to me than... I'm sorry. I understand. I understand how a man could feel that. She deserves that kind of love. But if you were freed, if I could prove that you did not kill Ann Brewster, would you go away? Now, Dorothy, I mean. I couldn't. I'm her husband. I'm in love with her, too. You're putting yourself quite completely into my hands. Such a promise would make me work very hard for you. You'll never get that promise out of me. It's almost 10 o'clock. In a minute, two detectives will be here to arrest you. What? You think you'd like to change your mind? No. No! Well, perhaps I'd better tell you. I asked them to come. You asked? Yes. You'll have to give yourself up. It'll be better. Only criminals wait to be caught. You're no criminal. Nor a murderer. I'm sure I can prove that. If I want to. A hat! A coat, a glove, mute witnesses of a crime. Who owned this glove? The murderer? Did the hand that wore this glove fire the shot that killed Ann Brewster? Mr. Hutchins, have you ever seen this glove before? No, sir. You wear gloves, don't you? Yes, sir, I always have. Mr. Mitchell, do you hear what's happening? What side? Hey, look at Mitchell. He's asleep. Maybe he doesn't like his client. No, that's a great human story. I can do something with that idea. Yes, sir. Mitchell must be sick. You own men but one pair of gloves. Let's go home. There's nothing to this case. The ones you had with you the night you surrendered? Yes, sir. I see. Now, this is a very important matter, Mr. Hutchins. That boy ought to get another lawyer. I could defend them better myself. Excuse me. You realize, of course, that this single glove was left by the murderer on the floor of your apartment. Now then, do you still deny that this glove found where the murderer dropped it is your property? I do. You do? You still maintain that you own but one pair of gloves, the ones you wore the night you were arrested? Yes, sir. Yet this pair of gloves was found in your bureau. They are of the same make as the glove left by the murderer and of the same size, size 8. I'd forgotten all about those. I bought them the day before, but I didn't like their color. That will be all, Mr. Hutchins. James Gardner. James Gardner to the stand. That's a real pretty hat you got on, dearie. Now, the next time you need something Wait, new or fine, I wish you'd come to my place. Way of the this about. is me. Is this the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, help you, God? I do. Mr. Gardner, how long have you been in the glove business? Thirty-three years. Look at this glove. Is it possible for you to tell the court where it was purchased? No. This sort of glove could be sold in almost any haberdashery. <laughs> Mr. Hutchins, will you step forward? Mr. Gardner, I will ask you, with the court's permission, to fit this glove on the defendant's hand.
You raise your hand for the jury to see? There, Mr. Gardner, isn't that what you'd call a perfect fit? Considering the age and stiffness of the glove, perfect. Uh, you can see here how the glove has taken on the shape of the owner's hand. You may remove the glove. Thank you, Mr. Hudson. Your witness, Mr. Mitchell. Now, Mr. Gardner, we all know that a shoe can be on the wrong foot. Isn't it possible for a glove to be on the wrong hand? Because this glove fits the defendant's hand, do you say it cannot fit another person's? No, I don't say that exactly. Then what do you say exactly? You see, I have a childish faith in experts. Won't you please justify my faith by sounding fairly expert? Mr. Gardner, look at my hand. I also happen to wear size 8 gloves. See how it fits. How snug it is. As if my hand were poured into it. It fits you. I can't deny that. It certainly fits you. In that case, I suppose you would testify that I was the murderer. Oh, no. I, I wouldn't say that. Heaven forbid. Thank you, Mr. Gardner. You may step down now. Thank you, Mr. Prosecutor. I am not unimpressed by my eminent colleague's ingenuity. Unfortunately, the article I am offering for inspection now is most unlikely to fit him. People's Exhibit Number 11. A woman's hat found, as we have heard, in the apartment after the murder. Police measurements in evidence show that it was not of the same size as the murdered girl's head. Again, therefore, I offer this to prove that it was not the property of Ann Brewster, but the property of another woman. A so far undiscovered woman. A woman who, perhaps... Your Honor? Mr. Mitchell. I contend that the hat cannot be introduced into evidence for the purposes of the prosecution, because there has not been sufficient foundation laid by expert testimony. Your Honor, where does the counsel for the defense expect me to find an expert on hats at this late stage? In a crowded courtroom like this, one finds representatives of many professions. Why, once I actually found a taxidermist. Are milliners so rare a breed? Your Honor, Your Honor, I'm a milliner. <laughs> Please step up here. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so for God? I certainly do. What is your name? Madam Dewberry. First name? First name? Do. Huh? Do. Dewberry, see? Is that your full name? Yes, sir. That and Mrs. Jones. This is Pansy Jones. But in hats, I'm Madam. <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. District Attorney. The defense may question the witness. Thank you. And now, what is your occupation, Madame Dubarry? I'm a modiste. Ah. Forsaking the path so lightly trod by your historic predecessor. Hmm? <laughs> now, madam. The district attorney seems to feel that this hat could not have belonged to the victim because its size does not correspond with the murdered girl's head size. What do you think of all this? I think the persecutor ain't never been a milliner. Fairies don't have to be snug. The less they fit, the better they fit. In that case, would you say that this hat was not necessarily another woman's? That it could have belonged to the victim? That she could have worn it to the apartment? Yes, sir. Before she was killed, I mean. Thank you, Madam Pompadour. You may step down. Unless you have something more to tell us. I ain't stepping down, no, sir. I got lots more to say. More, madam? Pertinent to the case? My land, what do you think I come to this trial for? To give free dope on hats? No, sir. I got more to say than that, and I'm going to say it. If I was in on the shooting, you wouldn't call that impertinent, would you? I withdraw my objection to the offer of the hat. But if it please, Your Honor, 
I should be delighted to examine the witness. Proceed. Well, it's like this. On the 4th of May, late in the evening, the telephone rings in my shop. I keep open late, see? Well, anyway, the telephone's going like mad, and I go and answer it, and I say like I always do, cautious-like. Hello? This is Hudson 31515, Madame DuBerry speaking. Well, next... Will the witness please repeat the number more clearly? Hudson 31515. Proceed, please. Well, next, I nearly dropped dead. I hear a woman's voice, frightened, kind of. Hello? There's a man here. Then the man's voice, shouting. Stop it, do you hear me? Then a shot! A revolver shot. Then somebody screams. Oh! Well, did I get excited to say. I was trembling like a leaf. Then what did you do after you ceased to be a leaf? I took a drink. <laughs> then I went to bed. Next morning, there it was in the papers, the Brewster killing. And the time was the same as when I got the call. And so Anne Brewster, just before her death, turned to you. Why? That's what I say. Why? I didn't know her. No friend of mine. <laughs> Not even a customer. And what made you decide to come here today and volunteer your testimony? That's the queerest part of all. <clears throat> Yesterday afternoon, somebody telephoned me at the shop. It's a man's voice, and he says, On the 4th of May, late in the evening, you were called up by a girl named Anne Brewster. And he repeats word for word what that girl said to me. Then he says, Tomorrow, a man will be tried for the murder of that girl. He's falsely accused. Your testimony can help free him. That voice. Had you ever heard that man's voice before? Yes, sir, twice before. It was the voice I heard over the telephone the day of the killing. The next day, the same voice called again. He said, who? I beg pardon, I didn't get the name. Oh, wrong number. Could you possibly describe that voice? It was the voice of an educated gentleman. But what kind of a voice? Like the defendant's? Like the district attorney's? Like my voice? Why, yes. Very much like your voice. Or maybe more like the judge's. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, that man with a voice like the judge's, like mine, who telephoned Madame du Barry yesterday is the murderer of Ann Brewster. Still loose. Still to be caught. Why, an innocent man is being tried in his place. I object, Your Honor. Yes, Mr. Mitchell. The court prefers to hear your conjectures in summation. Has the witness anything to add? Nothing, Your Honor. Except you should have seen Mrs. Gilhooly's hat. My land, it turned out a freak in my excitement. <laughs> Recess for 15 minutes. Robert. Now, wouldn't you think they put ice into this? Oh, I know I shouldn't be here, but I couldn't stay away. I couldn't. May I offer you a drink of this delicious lukewarm water? Robert, what are you trying to do? What are you leading up to? Have patience, my dear. Justice to all. So she was an absolute stranger, eh? Oh, I wouldn't say absolute. What? You knew her? Oh, then she wasn't a stranger. Well, not exactly a stranger. She looked the spitting image of a cousin of mine. But my cousin lives in Seattle, so I guess it couldn't have been her. But I think she looked most like a girl in my class at school. What class? Well, that Brewster girl wasn't over 26. Well, then, I guess that throws that out, don't it? Anyway, it couldn't have been her because she fell off a Ferris wheel in 1912 and broke her neck. People's Exhibit Number 5, an overcoat. On this coat was found the body of Ann Brewster, lying in a pool of blood. Sergeant Whalen, you have testified that you were the first person to pick up this coat at the scene of the crime. Am I right? Yes, sir. Will you now tell us what you found in this coat? A photograph in the inside breast pocket. Is that the photograph? Do you identify it? Yes, sir. That will be all, Sergeant Whalen. Mr. Hutchins, will you please return to the stand? This coat is yours, isn't it? No. That is... Yes, it's mine. But I don't know anything about a photograph. This picture, taken with a miniature camera, it shows a man who must be yourself. 
together with an as yet unidentified woman. The scenery is exotic. Palms and cactuses. I judge it was taken in Florida or Mexico, perhaps. But I've never been to Florida or Mexico. May I look at the photograph, please? Certainly, Mr. Mitchell. But the print is so bad that it is difficult to identify the people. Thank you. Your witness, Mr. Mitchell. Your witness, Mr. Mitchell. Thou witness. I beg your pardon. I have nothing further to ask of the witness. Nothing at all. Call the next witness. And the jury will be pleased to hear that it is my last. Thomas Sullivan! Thomas Sullivan! Hello, Mr. Hutchins. Raise your right hand and put your left hand up on the book. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth? But this is a human story, honey. Why well, I'm vibrating with emotion all over. Take it. To look at the wasted, tragic face of Robert Mitchell, the furrowed forehead, what? I mean, he looks dopey. Behind the veiled glance of those deep-seated eyes, one still discerns occasional flashes of forensic brilliance. Sure, like a guy that's been hit on the head with a gin bottle. Eight o'clock it was, you said? Yes, sir, eight o'clock. Mom sent me out to collect the garbage cans. That's because it was Tuesday and Pop was taking his clarinet lesson. So I started in looking for ginger ale bottles because I could get two cents on them at Schultz's candy store. Then I saw somebody coming down the steps and I thought it must be Mr. Hutchins. So I said, hello, Mr. Hutchins. He slowed down a bit but didn't answer. Just turned the other way and kept on going. I was surprised because, you see, Mr. Hutchins was always awful nice to us. Kids now, and... Tommy, we must be absolutely clear on one point. That man who came downstairs and went out of the house. Was it Jerry Hutchins? Must I answer that? You must tell the truth. It looked like him. Was he wearing an overcoat or wasn't he? He was, yes. What kind of a hat was he wearing? A soft felt hat. Like that one on the table? Yes, sir. This hat, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this hat worn by the man who sneaked down those stairs a few minutes after the murder is Jerry Hutchins' hat, worn by him when he gave himself up to the police. Now then, Tommy, look here. Can you describe the way this gentleman went down those stairs? Well, he had his hat pulled down. He... Turning up his collar. Turning up his collar. Did he seem distressed, disturbed? I don't know. I can't tell any more than I know. Before God and your conscience, was the man you saw Jerry Hutchins? Thomas Sullivan? Answer. Yes or no? Yes, yes. Say, look at Mitchell. Your witness, Mr. Tommy Sullivan, look at me. Now watch me carefully as I come down these steps. You! Thomas Sullivan, was I the man you saw on those steps? Yes, you're the man! <laughs> oh, it's marvelous. Marvelous. <laughs> I still can't believe it's true. Oh, Robert, if I could only tell you everything I feel. Tell me this much. 
Are you happy? So happy. Well, then everything is fine. <laughs> Jerry is freed, you're satisfied, and I'm covered with glory. I'm a pretty good lawyer, don't you think? But a rotten photographer. Well... <laughs> The district attorney kiss you and tell you how glad he is? And that he's really a human being after all? Oh, practically. He told me all about the wife and kitty. I came to tell you how... You came to tell me how anxious you are to be on your way with Dora there. You mustn't let me keep you. I'm not going away. Aren't you? Why not? Jerry's waiting. Oh, now look here. If you're thinking of our agreement, forget it. I'm not thinking of that. I'm simply coming back to you because that's what I want to do. Dorothea. Oh, don't, dear. Don't say anything. There'll be some nice girl tomorrow, the day after. And she'll mean so much more to you than I could ever mean. Dorothea's being magnanimous. She thinks this is a matter of honor. Oh, no. When that boy stood up and shouted in your face, then I knew. That glove, the milliner. And I was afraid for you. And somehow, Jerry, you just weren't there any longer. You see it, Jerry, don't you? You understand now. Yes, I understand. Many things. Well, let's get out of here. Take me home, dear. All right. <laughs> <laughs> 